Bless his name. Praise him like you know him. Praise like you believe him. You believe in the name of Jesus Christ. Give him a holler. Say glory. Hallelujah. I know some of you guys are conservatives. You guys come from a conservative background, and you know, they raise, oh, they raise their hands, they shout. Do you shout for the Raiders? Who do you shout for? The Cowboys. Okay. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Thank you, man. Do you shout for the Raiders? Yeah. Shout for the Dodgers, the Giants, right? You know, the Lakers, you know, the Clippers. The, oh, yeah, the Angels. I forgot about the Angels. <laughs> but we shout, we get crazy, right? I go out to a game with my daughter, and she's like, Dad, Dad, quit yelling. You're losing your voice already. You know, it's not even halftime late, and you already lost your voice. You know, but we get excited about other things. Why can't we get excited about our Lord and our Savior? Why can't we get excited about our King, Jesus Christ, right? We should be excited, you know. We should be saying, Hallelujah, I love you, Lord. Jesus, I love you. I bless you. I give you my life. You know, we we gotta, we got to be able to surrender ourselves to Christ. Because your life no longer belongs to you. It's been paid for by the blood of Christ. Something that's more precious than gold, silver, brass, than anything else. Your life was paid for. In full. In full. All your, all your sins are forgiven. I know some of you guys think, you know, oh, I'm just a sinner, you know, saved by, by grace. You were. You were. God, God. Jesus said on the cross, I'm going to say something just real quick because I want you guys to understand this because I know we come from different teachings of the Bible and different teachings of, the, of just the way we teach things. You know, as men that uh, Jesus Christ said it's finished. It is finished. His assignment was done. Everything that he had to do. According to God's will, God's purpose, he says, I completed it. So I finished it, Father. Now they're blessed. All they have to do is receive it and follow it. Receive me and follow me and their lives will be full. Your lives will be full. It's not religion. I'm not talking to you about religion. I'm talking to you about a man named Jesus Christ who came, lived, died, was buried three days, if you believe it or not. He died and he was buried three days. And he resurrected from the dead. And now he sits at the right hand of the Father. And, you know, people say, oh, he intercedes, he prays. He's sitting there praying for you. No, he's not. He stands there. He is the prayer. He's the answered prayer. He's everything. When we go to, when we go to heaven, you're not going to have a question for Jesus. You know, you know what happened to my little brother. You know what happened to my homeboy. You know what happened to my friend, to my mom, my dad. I have a question. You're not going to have that. I'm, I've never been to heaven, but I just know that I know that I know. When I see Jesus, tell me, that's right, he's my answer. Jesus Christ is the answer. For everything you're going through, for everything that you doubt, God is your answer. You just got to learn how to ask. You receive not because you ask not. You haven't asked the right questions. That's why you still struggle. A lot of men still struggle in their minds, in their emotions, because they haven't asked God, how do I deal with this? How do I get rid of this anger? How do I get rid of this bitterness? How do I get rid of this lying? How do I get out of uh, 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 rage? Because some of you have rage. You don't even have anger. You're beyond anger. Some of you have rage. You'll lose it. You'll go, to, you'll go to prison for 10, 15, 25 years because I have friends and I had brothers that gone to prison for 25, 30 years. And they said, if I could take those three minutes back, I would have made a different decision. Because of your emotion, the rage and the anger, you do something stupid that's going to cost you your life now. And all of us have gone through that. Maybe we didn't go to prison, but in our minds, in our emotions, our lifestyle, we're in prison sometimes. And we have to release that. Today's the day. Today's the day of salvation. Today is. 
Today you can walk out of here, Stevie, differently. I see the smile and I see the gladness, but I don't know what's on the inside. Just like I don't know what's going inside your house. If I open up a closet, then I'll find out what's going on in your house. You'll find out real quick when you open up a closet of somebody's house. All kinds of junk in there like, okay, there's junk here. Just like in every one of our lives, right? But it's time to clean it up. And God's here to do this. If you allow God, if you allow God to minister to you, to bless you, but you must allow him because God's not going to force you to. He's a gentleman. He's kind. He's gentle, full of wisdom, full of understanding. He understands what you're tripping on. He understands that. But you got to profess that. You got to profess it with your mouth, believe it in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Lord. He is the Son of God. You got to believe that. You got to profess that out of your own mouth, not out of my mouth. I can have it. Oh, come up here. We're going to do the, uh, the sinner's prayer. And I grab you by the hand or by your arm. Come on up here. That's no good. It's got to come out of you. You got to have the experience with God by yourself. I had to have an experience with God. I was saved. I was going to heaven. But I wasn't free. I was one of those guys that had rage. I jump out of a car real quick like when I, I'm talking about 30 years ago, brothers. I'm 63 years old, bro. This is when I was a youngster. You guys are youngsters to me. 35, 40 years old. You know, you guys are young, right? Tony, they're youngsters, huh? <laughs> right, Georgie? They're young guys, huh? <laughs> but God doesn't want you to waste your life or waste your time because nothing's wasted in God. Even if you had to go through hell and back, nothing is wasted. God will take all that that was behind you and he'll make it right. What the evil has meant for evil, what the devil has meant for evil, God has turned it around for the good. Amen. But I want you guys, I got every one of you guys here to surrender to God. No longer my life. God's life. No longer my way. You tried it your way, self. Did it work? No. Now, Stevie, has it worked? No. Does it? Uh, Georgie, has it doesn't work until we allow God to do it. And I don't care how rough you are, I don't care how many brothers you killed in your past and how much drugs you did. Oh, that's a joke to me now. Honestly, that's a joke to me. Been there, done all that stuff. Honestly, it's a joke when I hear guys tell me they did this, that, like, what's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're a roughneck. You're a roughneck. I say that in my head. I said, but are you tough enough to carry a Bible into your neighborhood? Are you rough enough to walk in your neighborhood and say, I love Jesus Christ, my brothers, and I'm here to share the love and the goodness of God with you. Do you got it? Can you do that? I had to do that. Go talk to the shot callers of your neighborhood. And someone say, hey, brother, you know, you better take a walk, brother, because you know what I got for you? Lead. You know, I said, I'm here to preach the gospel, bro. And you got to do what you got to do. I'm going to have to do what I got to do. Just like we did it in the old days. That's what we have to do here. We're men. We're men of a higher standard. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Amen. Our standard is higher than this world standard. And if we're living equally with the world, then something's wrong. Something is wrong. We should have conviction in our hearts. A conviction of God's love. God's love is so pure and so beautiful that he convicts you when you think wrong. Even when you're sitting here. Tell that little fat guy to sit down, man. He talks too much. The Spirit of God will tell you, you know what? You better be quiet and you better listen. Because I used to be that guy. I used to be there and I would talk to 
to myself to the, about the pastor. And I told my wife one time something about the pastor. She says, babe, you just need to uh, submit yourself to this man and let God do what he has to do in your life. And he did. And I honored my pastor. I haven't seen him in a long time, and I got to see him last Sunday. And it was a blessing. It was a blessing to see him. And I'm going to have him come preach with us here in June. I'm going to invite him over here. And I'll invite you guys to come. If you guys aren't here, he flows in the fivefold ministry. He's flowing. He flows in the spirit. He flows in the prophetic. He, flow, he flows in the uh, being an apostle. He just he builds people up. He builds the temple of the man up. That's what we're called here to do. Don't come here and say, you know what, I'm not, I'm here, I'm just here to, it's Saturday, I'm here to get the tacos. That's all right, that's all right, because God, Jesus said that, right? You don't come for me, you come because I feed you. If you guys read your Bible, he said that. Because I feed you, exactly right. Because you eat, you get to eat, and that's okay. I, that's a tactic of, turn, of Turning Point Fellowship, men of a higher standard, that's our tactic. That's the plan I have to feed you, to come over here and drink all the coffee, all the donuts you want, all the pastries you want, all the tacos you can eat, even if I don't eat, brother, it don't matter to me, as long as you guys are here. And you just, I want you guys to be open. So I want you guys to raise your hands, every If you have your caps off, take off your caps. She said, respecting the Lord. Father, we bless you. We thank you as we surrender this day, Father, our lives, our very present time, Father, right now, Lord, our todays, our tomorrows, our future, Lord God. We surrender it all to you, that you would have your way and you would have your say, Lord God, that your will be done, Father, and not our will. We release it all right now. We release it all, Father, our spirit, soul, and body. We open up our minds, our ears, our hearts, our eyes, Father, that we would see the power, the signs, and the wonders of the gospel, the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I thank you. I thank you for their lives. I thank you for their families, for their wives, Lord God. For their grandsons, Lord, I thank you that they're saved, that they believe in you, they trust in you, Father. That they've given their hearts to you, Father. They're not leaning on their own understanding, but they're giving you their hearts, Father, that you would order, Father, their steps. Order their steps here today. Father, when they walk out of this place and they hear the gospel preached today, they'll leave differently. They'll never, ever, ever be the same again, Lord. I thank you for the brothers that are on their way right now. I thank you for divine protection over their vehicles, Father, over their families, over their minds, Lord. We come in peace, Father. We come in peace, your peace. So we just thank you and we bless you as we worship you, we honor you. We're not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are not, Father. But we know it is salvation, Father, first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. So we're here, Father, to raise our hands, to clap our hands, to raise our voices, Father, in celebration of who you are, that you're our Savior, our God. You're our Master. Your name is Jesus. Yahweh. That's who you are, my Father. So we're going to honor you. As we surrender today in Jesus' name, and all his handsome men said, Amen. All righty, Mr. Josh. Good morning. Glad to be here. Amongst my brothers and friends. I just feel this in my spirit, just if we can sing this chorus real quick. And the angels cry.
is called Holy Forever. Your name is the highest. Your name is the greatest. Your name stands above and all. All thrones in dominions, all powers and divisions. Your name. this morning as we ask God to open the heavens Oh, 
tomorrow how many want to follow him to bring freedom and salvation to the nations come on you know we can just sing open the heavens just so that we can bask in it and not, not that there's anything wrong with it but let's go to the next step lord open the heavens for salvations open the heavens for our nation open the heavens for our children Open the heavens for our cities. So basically we're saying, not just for us. That's right. Open heaven so you might flow through us. Amen? Yeah. Amen.
in our lives, right? We've had battles, but we've had victories, right? 
We dance for victory for what God has done. We have we dance for victory for what God has done in the past. We dance for victory for what he's doing right now. And we dance for victory for what he's going to do tomorrow. Amen. I've had victories in the past. And I have battles right now that I'm claiming victory for. My kids, my city, my finances, my church. And I'm dancing for victory. So you don't have to wait to dance for vic for your kids to come to Christ or for your finances to line up or for the things you're believing for or for the for the revival that's going to happen in this city and in my city yes. and other cities I'm already dancing for victory here yes. for what's going to happen here yes. you see what I mean it's a victory all across from behind to now and to tomorrow so dance for victory because the things you're going through right now, you're going to get the victory to today. Today. It might manifest tomorrow, but you're going to rejoice today. See, that's the breaker anointing right now. Release your war cry. Release your war cry. Release your war cry. Shout it out. Shout it out. Release your war cry. Release your war cry. Release your war cry. Release your war dance. Release your war dance. Release your war dance. Dance for victory. Dance for victory. Release your war dance. Release your war. Victory, victory. 
the scene, it changes everything. Amen. We have time for one more. gentlemen, are we good at worship? Come on. I want you guys to know that this is war. You guys, you guys don't understand what's going on. Some of you. He's a worship leader. And he worships in war against the enemy, against the darkness, against the high uh, uh, principalities that come against us. And you, I, some of you guys have been in fights before. physically. We don't fight that all that way anymore. Now we fight spiritually. So when I was watching them jump up and down and, and stomp, they're stomping on the devil. They're stomping on the plans that he has to destroy our faith, to lay doubt and disbelief in our hearts right now in his own church, in God's own house. He's trying to put doubt and disbelief in you. He said, I'm trying to stop you from raising your hands, from coming to the altar. Oh, we don't do that. Well, do something different you ever done in your life. I didn't do this before either. I didn't come to the altar. I was like you guys here, and I put my hands in my pocket. Like, no, nah, this is crazy. These people have lost it. But as, as I began to do it, God began to set me free. And that stuff just begins to, doesn't even weigh on you no more. Yes, it falls off on you. And some of you just got to come out of your comfort zone. You've been comfort too long. That's why things ain't changing in your lives. Things aren't changing in your marriage. They're not changing in your family. They're not changing in your workplace. You're not getting those uh, positions you should be getting, you believing for, and things like that. It's until you trust God and do something different. In your heart. You know, I know, I know he's speaking to you.
that'll break something, that'll change something in your life. And I did it, and I never stopped jumping. I never stopped celebrating Jesus. I used to celebrate the devil. They used to put on music, and I'd be out there breaking a hip and everything, you know, grinding on a girl and all that stuff. We did all that for the devil. But for God, we can't dance for God. We can't celebrate God. We celebrate God. Christ is our Lord and our King. Right, Stevie? No one else. No one else.
if the men of God would come down to the front on a Sunday morning or Thursday nights or other services and lead the way of our families and show we're not ashamed as men we're not ashamed to come down to the front and worship because it's easy here right amongst men but what about in front of our kids what about in front of our families and friends and the whole church I just I just charge you to do this every Sunday not, not waiting for someone to invite you down really if someone invites you if the pastor invites you down it's really God inviting you down through the pastor so just take the invite now from the Lord and be the first one I just decided I didn't want to be a follower anymore I want to be a leader I'm, it's easy to follow right to have our hands in our pockets and just, you know, sit there. But it, His grace is sufficient for you. Don't let guilt hold you back either. If you're struggling with something, still run down to the aisle, to the altar, and surrender. Don't stay there because you think, oh, I can't. I'm not doing well in this. No, that's when you should go down and say, here I am, God. He already knows. Why do you think he died for us? He already knows that we, we have weaknesses. Don't wait. Just even right now, if you have something, something you're struggling with. The other day, God, I was praying about this and that. Lord, help me to be better and this and that. He just said, son, just come to me like a child. A child, just my, when my kids were little, they just came up to me. Hey, Dad, I need, a, I need help with this. Or they just came to me. Come to him as a child. He's just saying, just come to me. I'll fix you. I'll clean you up. But you know what coming means? Coming means surrender. I'm not ashamed. Here I am, Lord. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. arms around each other right now. Just let's sing it together in unity. Just put an arm around someone. Come on, let's lock arms. We need each other. We need each other. Some of us are stronger than others. I'm not ashamed. 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 I
I'm not ashamed to worship you, worship you, to worship you, worship you. I'm not ashamed. 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 I'm not ashamed to worship you, worship you. To worship you, to worship you. When I sing to you, Can we take a stand. I feel like we're in the we're in the the times where we need to take a stand. Where do you stand? Are you unashamed of Jesus? It's time to take that stand. It's time to be unashamed. It's time to be not one foot in, one foot out. Bible said, God says, you're either for me or you're against me. And you'll know, you'll know someone who's not ashamed by the way they worship. They just, they just lift up their hands, they get on their knees, they dance, they, they express. We've lost passion today in, in the church. We've lost passion as men and women of God. We've lost that passion. Whatever you're passionate for, you you give all to it, right? Sports, boxing, vanilla, whatever. But what about giving all your passion in worship? What about giving all your passion in, in, in your walk with God? Where's our passion for the Lord? It's trying to go dormant. But I pray, I, I believe that God's stirring it up. Stirring up your passion. Passion for just one thing, and that's Him. That's Him. Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't go back to your vomit. And I'm so sorry. I I don't mean to preach. I'm just supposed to do worship, but it's just flowing out of me this morning. And I honor and respect your pastor for how he disciples you guys. And and, um, God is so proud of him. God is so proud. something when God's men come and worship him. They don't come for no other moment, for no other reason. Come for a time like this. An impartation has taken place into your lives. An impartation means that the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, drops something in you. God and you come, obedience follows the obedience of the man. You guys obey. Not this man, but you follow that man, Jesus Christ. And when you come, God changes your lives. And he does new things. We're not the same men no more. You're not going to be the same men. Some of you guys know about that. You're never going to live. 
comfortable. You're never going to live at peace because God loves you too much. And he loves us here too much. To leave you the way he found you. I don't care how you come. Shorts, sandals, wife beaters, whatever. God's going to change you. He's not going to change your outside. You can't take those tattoos off. That's a testimony. That's a witness unto God. What God can do in a man's life. God can change the inside. And that's what he's about, changing our lives. And that's what this ministry is about. Men of a higher standard to change our lives. Allow him. Like he did today. We're going to go ahead and uh, release our, our worship team. Men of a higher standard, amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. Glory to God. Come on, give these, give these men of God a, a good round of applause in Jesus. Applause in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. It's, hey, brothers, it's, it's good to cheer each other on. We used to put, put each other down. Remember, Frank, we should sit there and stare at each other so we can last the longest without, you know, blinking and all, all kinds of stupid stuff. No, I, I used to do that stuff, stand there like, you know, until you get into it. How stupid. We don't have to do that no more. We can, we can celebrate one another. Good to see you, Mario. Celebrate you, my brother. Amen. That's how it should be. We should be glad when we see each other. We should be happy. That you know what? The brother made it. Because I would not even want my worst enemy to go to hell. I would not. When you get God's heart, you wouldn't even want that. For your ex-wives, for your ex-friends or ex-homeboys, whatever. You would never want that. Not if you're a man of God. I want the best for them, man. I may not get along with them. I may not know them. But you know what? I'm going to pray for them. And I'm going to believe that I will see them in heaven. And they're going to say, Stephen, you don't even remember me, Stevie. But, you know, you, you preached the gospel to me. You shared the gospel of Christ with me. And I'm saved because of what you said through Christ. God uses men to minister. Neither you get the glory, but he uses you. And be grateful that he uses you. Thank you, Father, for using me. A humble heart. A grateful heart, a thankful heart that he, he got used today. He, he used you to come to the altar. That's how beautiful God is. So no, 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 that guy was just pushing. That guy was persuading, man, my God. No, no, no. God does that. He pushes us. Gets us out of our comfort zone, right? That he could change our lives. I thank you guys for coming out. I thank you for being part of this. We are going to eat. Uh, Give this brother like 30 minutes, you know, that uh, he's a fast speaker, you know, but he's a good speaker. He's a good speaker. <laughs> the brother, Andy Mayer. Come on, let's give him all a round of applause. <laughs> Captain Andy Mayer. I love this man. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Since when have you ever got 30 minutes? Man, he always gets more. Is that what I got, 30 minutes? Really? Okay. I do? Well, um, I would echo some of what, so Josh spoke some of my message. Pastor Angel and his encouragement spoke some of my message. So, And then you guys had a great time of ministry to where we were able to just sit in the presence of God and, and things happened. But something Josh said struck out a couple things, actually. And we, when we sang the song, How to Trust God, and how do you trust God? Well, at the end of my, thank you. That's a big board. <laughs> how could you miss that? <laughs> oh, you don't? Oh, okay. All right, amen. Thank you. Oh, yeah, that too, right, yeah. So at the end of what I got to say to you guys today, I can give you a couple tools on how to trust God and what it's going to take to do that. 
because I saw some things in it. First off, let me just open right quick and say, Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for this time to be able to impart to your men, Lord God. I pray you use me, Lord God, as a ready pen writer, Lord God, that I be able to deliver just what you want, nothing more, nothing less, Lord God. I want to give you, give, uh, I give you praise and glory for dropping this in my heart, Lord God. And I just thank you for it and let the men have ears to hear and most of a heart to be open to receive the impartation so we can be able to make the change, Lord God, that we need to make to affect our families, communities, workplaces, Lord. And I just ask that and thank you and believe and trust in it is yes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, you may be seated. All right, I got that one right. Okay, I want to uh, thank Pastor Angel for allowing me to come up here and uh, speak to you guys. Um, I recently retired. Woohoo! Right? So prior to retiring, I thought, Ooh, what am I going to do? I'm just, I was telling George what I was going to do. I said, about a year ago, I thought, I'm going to do nothing. I'm going to flat do nothing. I said, I'm going to retire. I'm going to kick back, relax, and do all that. Thought, what ministries do we want to continue on and keep doing? And then I thought, when we got to the mountain last year, I knew, <laughs> funny, huh? Right. <laughs> I knew that, oh, well, we got to continue the mountain ministry for sure, and I'm going to be part of it, whatever it takes to continue to do that. But God has birthed another ministry, I believe, into me and my wife. And we've talked to Pastor Angel about it, and he's okayed it, and so we'll, that'll be to follow but really what I thought was that I was getting old. Yeah, well, I'm not that old. That's right. I'll be 69 pretty soon uh, in a couple months. And I thought, yeah, baby, that's it. Time to retire. Tony, I know where you're at. I know what do you want. That's right. So I thought, oh, it's going to be time to retire, you know, stuff like that. And, uh, and then it was... Um, Brother Diego, there he is, Pastor Diego, my new son-in-law, yes, he spoke a word last year, I want to say, and he, when he spoke, I think he spoke on a Thursday night, and he said how he's reading the Bible, he did the Bible in one year, and he had a lot going on last year, and he was still able to manage to get to read the Bible in one year, and I thought about it, and I thought, huh. I haven't read the Bible complete in a while. I've read it before, and I've read it in segments. I've read, you know, part of Genesis, and then you jump to Proverbs, and then the New Testament, stuff like that. Well, now I'm reading it chronologically, they call it, right? From start to finish that way, right? And I'm doing it with a, uh, an online thing called Tara Lee Cobble, the Bible Recap. You like that one, huh? Yeah, that one's good. So I didn't know you used that. So anyway, I did that. I know Fred's doing it now too, so I knew he would appreciate it. And Samuel, that's where we're at now, right? Second Samuel, right? But as we started going and I started reading it, I was, I was looking at um, things jumped out at me. I mean, they jumped out at me like never before, right? Never before. We've read the Old Testament, gone through it, and I've never had things jump out at me like that, like like it has this time. So I'm going to talk about three men in the Bible in Old Testament times and one in New Testament times. And I'm going to be speaking about, talking about Moses, Joshua, and Caleb. And the fourth person I'm talking about is men of a higher standard. That's each and every one of us. Each and every one of us here like Pastor said, we're men of a higher standard. So as we started out, I was, I got, uh, yeah, like I said, I thought I could retire. I thought, yep, I'm getting old. Well, do most of us know how old Moses was when he started his ministry? 80. 80 that's right. 80 years old. I was like, 80? He started at 80? And I'm whining at 68, 69 years old. He started his ministry at 80. Caleb kind of started his at 85. 
He went on from there at 85. I'm like, oh, my word. So, yeah, no kidding, right? Now, yes, they did live longer, but still, they started their ministry. They weren't afraid to start their ministry. Now, all three of these men have things in common, and they were they very similar to what we got going on in our lives, if you ask me. So, I thought I would be that, but I'm not. So, I'm not too old. So, if anybody is over 85 here, well, you might be excused. But I don't see anybody, not even Tony, is over 85, okay? So that means you're all included in this, right? So it's, I want to ask you guys, who do you see yourselves as? Do you see yourself as a Moses? Do you see yourself as a Joshua? Or do you see yourself as a Caleb? And if you're one of those or not, you are one of those. And it's are you willing to come alongside that Moses? Are you willing to help out that Joshua? Are you willing to be that man to stand in that gap like we were talking about singing this morning as to standing in the gap for our families and our churches? So here we go, a quick snapshot of Moses, right? So he's 40 years old. He grew up. We know the story, right? He drew out. Pharaoh raised him. So I'm thinking he had a pretty good life. I think he was living, when you're living with Pharaoh, I'm thinking you're doing pretty good, man, right? So it turns out 40, 40 years old, 40 years old, something had stirred up inside of him all along. I believe it was his mom who helped wean him and got him, uh, you know, tell him about, you are really a Hebrew, you know. So, of course, Moses kills an Egyptian, and then he finds that, they find out, he's like, oh, man, I got split. I'm out of here. So he leaves, he runs out to the wilderness, and how long was he out in the wilderness? 40 years. How many times is 40 mentioned in the Bible? The New King James Version, it's mentioned 157 times in the King James Version. 40 is a big number. I didn't realize it was that big. 40 is a big number. How many days did it rain in the, with Noah in the flood? 40 days and nights. How many days was Jesus out in the wilderness being tempted? 40, right? So 40 comes up a whole bunch of times. How many years were they in the wilderness? 40. How many days were the spies camping out? 40. No kidding. So 40 turned out to be a big time. 40 seems to be that some people think it's the symbolizing a trial or probationary time. So Moses does his 40 years, bones out, stands out out in the wilderness now, going, whew, man, I'm just, I'm not going back there. I'm not going to do any of that sort of stuff right there, right? So now he's 80 years old. So God has had 40 years, I think, to soften his heart, harden him up a little bit, work him over somewhat. Interesting thing here about myself, you guys see I got a beard now, right? Tony knows, right, to yeah, okay, right, there, yes, right, well, where I worked, you couldn't have a beard, so for 25 years, I did not have a beard, right, Tony knows me for a long time, never had it, but he might have known me when I had one way back in, so 40 years of testing, right, well, when I was 35 years old, I thought I wanted to be a pilot, but I had a beard, and my attitude then was, Phew, they're going to miss out on a good pilot, man, because I ain't going to shave my beard, right? So then I spent five more years working on tugboats, beating myself up, and going out there pulling wires and doing all sorts of stuff that, that was pretty hard work. And then at 40, I never thought of this till I did this, at 40, I saw these ship pilots and go, I'm going to give that guy, I'm going to give that a try. I'm going to, where's my razor? So I shaved my beard and... And eventually, and four years later, I got a job. But it took time to do that. But I had to sacrifice my beard. But, but my attitude is what really had to change. I finally got to the point was like, okay, if this is what I'm going to be, a tugboat guy for the rest of my life, praise God. I'm happy. I'm good. Everything is fine. I'll deal with it. You know, I'll be good. And then I got called up. They said, hey, we could use you. I'm like, woohoo! So by that time, I had my razor was gone, so... The beard was gone, right? So that took care of that. But that was at 40 for me. And I know a lot of you brothers out here are 40-ish, one way or another. Yeah, I know. I see them. I know. 
So that's an important time in your lives for you guys to make decisions. You ask me, okay? All those times in the Bible, 40-ish, think about that, all right? Oh, yeah. The other one was how many, how many days was Moses up on the mount? 40 days. All right, so now we know 40 is big, right? So let's get to Exodus 3. Verse 1, we go out there, we know the story, right? And I want to look at verse number 4. Exodus 3, verse 4. So Moses is out in the desert, minding his own sheep, doing what he does, right? And right here, so when the Lord saw that he turned to look, God called to him from the midst of the burning bush and said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, what? And what is God calling you guys? You hear God calling you guys this morning? I did. I heard him calling me and you guys too. Everybody, that was... That was what also what Josh was doing today. I call that was, that was prophecy that he was singing over you guys. And if it struck with you, if you go, oh, that's me, you grab onto that and hold on to that word and remember it and write it down because that's a prophetic word for each and every one of us out there today. So who was Moses? Well, I got down with it. Moses was, you, you're not going to believe all these things I got here. I got so many things that I finally had to ask God last night. I said, God, I can't do this. I can't do it without you. I needed your help. So I tried to get it to make it where it'd be chronologically in order to go this way. So we have that. He said, Moses, here I am. So God proceeds to tell Moses all these great things you're going to do. He goes on and on. We're going to do all this. We're going to do that. We're going to go here. We're going to take out these Amalekites and Anamites and all these kind of ites, right? And he says in verse 10 of this same thing, if we go to verse 10 right now, Exodus 3, 10. And he said, come now, let's go. Therefore, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. He said, that's it. Let's go. Come on, let's hit it. And what does Moses say? Well, that's right. Moses said, yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. Yeah, but. You know, as a pilot, a harbor pilot, I trained guys. I was one of the guys that trained new ship drivers. And I would tell them, I said, yeah, but is not in your vocabulary anymore. And they would go, yeah, but. I go, there you go. What did you not understand? I just told you that's not part of our conversation anymore. You're doing a new job. You don't know how to do it. You've never done it. Trust me and follow me, and this is what we're going to do. So Moses gave Jesus, gave God, gave Jesus, gave God all these things of what he can do. And then he's going to say, who am I going to say sent me? So in Exodus 4, if we could go to Exodus 4. Verse 1. And he says, suppose they will not, so he's asking, God, he, Moses is asking God, says, say, suppose they won't believe me or listen to my voice. And they say, the Lord didn't appear to you. So the Lord said to him in number two, what is that in your hand? He said, and he said, it's a rod. He said, cast it to the ground, in verse three. So he cast it to the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. He jumped back. He was scared. Then Moses said, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and caught it, and it became a rod in his hand. He said that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, had appeared to you. And in 6, furthermore, he said, now put your hand in your bosom. And he put his hand in his bosom. When he took it out, it was leprous like snow. And he said, put your hand back in. He put it back in and drew it out. And behold, it was restored like the other flesh. Right? So all these signs he's given to them. And then he says in verse 9, if they don't believe even these two signs or listen to your voice and you shall take water from the river, 
poured on dry land, the water which you take from the river will become blood on the dry land. And then all those things go on, and Moses says to the Lord, yeah, but, so he didn't get my speech. But he says, O Lord, I am not eloquent neither before nor since you have spoken to me, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. And he said, and God said, who made your mouth? And he goes on, and he said, O Lord, please send by the hand whoever else you may send. So by this time, God's ticked. He's like, okay, I had enough of this. You know your brother Aaron, he's a Levite. Bring, look, he's coming out to meet you right now. We'll bring him out, and now you take this and use my words that I put in you, you put in him. And you shall take this rod in the hand, and which shall shoot, you shall do the signs. So, but who was Moses? So Moses was a friend of God. And I can tell you in Exodus 33, verse number 11, Good. Oh, I can look up there, right? So I'll read it. So, Mo so the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And he would not return to the camp, but his servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the tabernacle. Okay, Joshua's, did you hear that? He did not depart from the tabernacle. Exodus 24, 12 please. So if you believe you're called to be a Joshua to come alongside somebody, when you're told to stay put, stay put. If you're told to go here, go there. Exodus 24, 12, and I probably read this before, and maybe it didn't hit me as much as it hit me this time. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and be there, and I will give you tablets of stone, and the law and commandments which I have written, that you may teach them. And number 13, so Moses arose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God. So Joshua, again, is still sitting there. He's still following him. He's going where he was, he's doing what he was told, and he's behaving like he's supposed to behave, Right? So, so now he gets, this, gets all what he's supposed to do. He goes and he says, this is, uh, of course, after we leave uh, the Exodus now, right? So Joshua is on the scene, I call it, in Exodus 24. Moses gave God all the excuses and he said, you're still going to have to go do what I told you to do. And so now the people are freed, right? We're going to skip some stuff. You've got to be with me here because the just of the thing is, Okay, all the plagues come to pass. The men, the Israelites, get released. They're marching out into the desert. And at about, this is one of, this blew me away, about year one, year one, year one and a half, and they celebrated years by the Passover. Uh, Passover was what they used as, as their calendar, right? So at year one and a half, God tells them, oh, by the way, you guys got to build a tabernacle. You guys got to build, and I'm going to need all these pieces, the Ark of the Covenant. And you're going to build them with gold. You're going to, they're going to be this size, this tall, this big, all this sort of stuff. And I was like, holy God. How many years, what, did we, what were we doing prior to this? Making bricks, right? All, 400 years or so, and we're out making bricks. And then all of a sudden now it's like, oh, by the way, you're going to be, you're going to be the, uh, a coppersmith. You're going to be a goldsmith, silversmith. You're going to be a wood butcher. You're going to be all those guys that are going to do all my things. Well, I'm like, how in the world could that happen? Well, I, I got the answer to that. But God imparted his spirit into him. So, so what my takeaway from that was, if God has called you, he can equip you. Right? If God has called you, and are we called? Yes. Every one of us are called by God to do what we're supposed to do. So if God has called you, he can equip you. Amen. That was my whoo. I'm like, oh, I had to stop. I had to stop and back up the page. 
They've been brick guys for 400 years. It's not like, oh, your son is, follows your lead, my son's follow my, you know, there wasn't any of that. It was like, okay, now you want to build, you want to build this? He goes, so I'm like, oh my gosh. All right, so that one, that one got me, right? So they did that and they built it, and I'll tell you how in a bit, what really struck to me was, and then a year or two now, we send out to 12 spies, right? And two of those spies were Joshua and Caleb, right? So they send out to 12 spies, and we come back, and they come back with a bad report, right? Everybody comes back and says, oh, man, this place is giants. Yeah, it, w- it had big fruit. It had all this sort of stuff, but there were giants in the land. There were giants in the land. We couldn't, we couldn't, we, we can't take them. There's giants in the land. But in Numbers 13, verse 30, So this is like year two of what's going on, right? Check this out. I call this guy Caleb. This is one of the early things I saw, Caleb. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, hey, knock it off. Let's go up at once and take this possession for we are well able to overcome it. So I kind of pictured Caleb like a hothead. He's like, oh, dude, really? We ain't got this? It doesn't say Joshua spoke up. It didn't say Moses spoke up. It said, then Caleb jumped in. Yep, and what the word, his name Caleb means, all heart, faithful, brave. And that to me has struck him, that is perfect to what he was. He jumped up and said, oh no, we can take these people. Right, so they go on from there. And they're like giants. They said, we're not going to be able to do this. And then the, then the people started, oh, I almost used a bad word. Uh, <laughs> well, whining and complaining. I was going to say pissing and moaning. Right? Sorry. I did. Oh, I did. You're right. Apologies, Pastor. But that's what they did. They started whining and complaining. Right? That's what the whole thing was. The whole, this, all this journey all the 40 years whining and complaining and actually they continue on after that too but they whined and complained the whole time but Moses was a, an intercessor Moses was a mediator Moses he was also a patient man up to a point I go right he was chosen by God he was a mediator and he was an intercessor right so he falls down him and Aaron both his brother fall down And they start saying, oh, you know, they start interceding for the people. But Joshua, let's look at uh, Numbers 14, 6. All right. But Joshua, yeah, yeah, got it. Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes and spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is exceedingly good. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land. Give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. And then Joshua says, Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are... Okay, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. And all the congregation said to them, Stone them, stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle of the meeting before all the children of Israel, and I think they split. It doesn't quite say that, but I'm thinking if people were going to stone me, I'd probably be on my way. Right? But you could see that Joshua was doing just what Moses did. He was an intercessor. He came alongside and he started to say, oh, let me intercede for him. Let me stand on their behalf. You know, I think he was more of a, not a peace, keep, he was a peacemaker. I'll go with that. There's a difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper, right? You keep peace at all costs. A peacemaker makes peace. So, 
but him and both Caleb. Now, Caleb and Joshua, since they were the two spies, so you see, God gets mad and said, all of you guys that have entered into the, you're not going to enter into the promised land. Now, this was year two. So he told them, the only two that are going are going to be Joshua and Caleb. So they were above the cutoff of the 20 years and older, because God said from 20 and back, you're going to go through. 20 and over, you're all going to die, because you all whined and complained out here in the wilderness. I had enough of you. Right? Except, except, it says, for Caleb, the son of Jephna, and Joshua, the son of Nun's. Everybody else, you shall by no means enter into the land that I swore I would make you dwell in. He said, but your sons that you were worried about, you know, because they were complaining that we're not having any water for our families and all that. Your sons, you shall be shepherds in the wilderness for 40 years and bear the brunt of your infidelity. So for 40 days, they had to spend out there, just like we said, right? In verse 36, in Numbers 14, 36. Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report, those very men who brought evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephna, remained alive. So that was the second time. That, that, so if you didn't hear that God said Caleb and Joshua were going into the promised land, he said it twice to make sure you understand Caleb and Joshua are going in even though they're above the age limit, right? Okay. So I'm getting there. I am moving. I didn't know how I was going to make it. <laughs> God makes a way. Praise God he made a way, right? They entered the promised land. So as they're going through the promised land, right, they have on their way to the promised land, forgive me, right, which I don't think they went far. It was an 11-day trip, right? It should have been 11 days, and they didn't. How far did they go? I don't know. They didn't go that far. Yeah, but I always thought they went around and around the mountain, I think they just kind of like camped out at an oasis because they had all these, all the people, how many million they figure, how many million, right? They had 400,000 men. So if you start out with them, if you got 500, you got over a million people, right? That's a pretty big tribe, <laughs> right? So you also know, remember that Moses, not Moses, but God parted the Red Sea for them all to cross through when they were being chased by the Egyptians, right? Well, Brother Ryan spoke last week, and you might have remembered it, but also the Jordan River got stopped when they finally crossed over into the Promised Land. So, and yikes, he got, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but I did, this was like all for me, though, Pastor. You know, you always say you preach to yourself, like I said, I'm old, I'm going to quit. Yeah, no way. Right, okay, so praise God. Right, thank you. So, <laughs> oh, where was I? So, also, the Ark of the Covenant went, so Joshua also followed suit, and God parted, not parted, he stopped the Jordan River. He held it up here. They walked down here. There was no water there. They got to the other side. Then they carried the Ark of the Covenant, which they had to build being bricklayers, right? George, you appreciate that, cement guys, right? Now they're going to be carpenters and masons and stuff like that, right? So they get through that. So he did that. So as a Joshua, you do what you see Moses, your Moses do if you're coming alongside them, right? That's what you do. You do what you learn what he did. Kate or Joshua also learned because he sent spies out, right? He sent spies into the promised land and say, hey, man, go check it out. But you know who's going? You and you. Just you two, too. I learned we ain't sending 12. We're sending two. Well, only two of your brothers are going. And Caleb, you're one of them. I know you're going to come back with a good report. So Caleb was one of them, right? So Caleb went out there, and he did that, right? So Moses finally gets to where the, the, the 
The people of Israel are crying out again because they have no water. Just prior to that, Miriam, Moses' sister, had died. She was a prophetess back then. So, God, he goes to, here, let me get this so I get it right. I don't want to miss the exact words. <sighs> Numbers 20. Now, this is year 38 now. We're jumping ahead, okay? But this is year 38. In year 38, Numbers 20, verse 8, God gave Moses specific instructions on what to do. He said, take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, gather the congregation, speak to the rock, as he had done before, he brought water out of a rock before, and it will yield its water. You shall bring the water out and give them drink to the congregation and their animals. Okay? Verse 9. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded, and Moses and Aaron gathered the assemblies together. And here's, this is what Moses said. Hear now, you rebels, must we bring water out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand, struck the rock twice with the rod, and water came out abundantly, and their congregation and their animals drank. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and said, Because you did not believe me to hollow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. So, this to me is what Pastor Angel says, adding a little bit of cream and sugar, a little too much cream and sugar to the coffee. Moses took it upon himself, said, Here now, you rebels, must we? And I'm like, who is we? Right? Who's we? Who's he talking about? We? Me and God? Me and God, we're going to do this? Oh, me and Aaron? I was like, whoa, who? you and who? So he thought he was all that in a bag of chips, or he was all done with them people and had enough. But that was year 38. He had two more to go. He knew he was only going to be in 40 years. He had two more to go, couldn't hang, had enough. He was like, I'm done. Peace out, right? But it cost him, all he did was to get to see the promised land. He wasn't able to go into it. And at that time, he commanded Joshua, laid hands on him and prayed for him and said, you're going to take the people. God said, I'm going to use Joshua to take the people in. But what I want to tell you, and this is what I started out with, I want to tell you how you can accomplish what God has called us to do, right? So here's, here's where we're going to give it to you right here. So when all the, when, when they left Egypt, they not only left as a free, um, free people, they gathered up everything that they could get. They plundered the, the Egyptians. They took gold, silver, everything they could get their hands on. God said, take it all. So now this is a year one, in year one or so. They're going to build this Ark of the Covenant. And they're like, how are we going to do this? And God said, have all the people who are willing Willing, willing people, willing people. It took a willing people, and this is, this is where it's at right here. Let me get it right. Exodus 35. Yep, Exodus 35. Verse 10. And the Lord said, Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze. That's 35.5, I think, right? Yeah, there you go. And verse 10. All who are gifted artisans among you shall come and make all that the Lord has commanded. And then it goes on his tabernacles, tent, and all that. And it's like, how, how do you get that? Well, God imparted to him. God's spirit. He didn't have like we have the Holy Spirit that each and every one of us can have now. It was back then God imparted the spirit of God on him. He imparted it on him. It wasn't like a free reign like we have now. We have 
the full power. In, in Acts chapter 8, 1, 8, it says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, right? And you shall be my witnesses in all Judea and Samaria and all to the ends of the earth. So we have, we have that power that's already in us right now. But back here, these guys had to have a willing heart. So check it out. And this is what I got. So the, in verse 29 of Exodus 35, 29, the children of Israel brought a freewill offering to the Lord. All the men and women and women whose hearts were willing to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord by the hand of Moses had commanded to be done. Verse 30, and Moses said to the children of Israel, see, the Lord has called by name Bezael, the son of Uri, and the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the Spirit of God, in wisdom, in understanding, in knowledge, and all manner of workmanship, to design artistic works, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting jewels for setting, in carving wood, and to work in all manner of artistic workmanship. He, and he has put in his heart the ability to teach in him and Ahaloib, the son of Ashimach of the tribe of Dan, he has filled them with skill to do all manner of work of the engraver and the designer and the tapestry maker in blue, purple, scarlet, fine thread, linen, and of the weaver to those who do every work and those who design artistic works. He dropped everything he needed into them by the Spirit of God. And these guys had everything they needed to accomplish what they needed to accomplish back then coming from making bricks and pyramids. And we today have the power of Jesus Christ living in us. We have the Holy Spirit living in us. To, so we're able to accomplish all those things that we need. Those men work together, Moses, Joshua, and Caleb, all work together to accomplish what God wanted to have done. Right? Yes, he did. So we have all that same authority in us. Moses died at 120. 120. So we got plenty of time. Don't, don't stress it. Right? <laughs> Joshua was 110 when he died. So the things I learned... Are we giving God excuses? Are we giving God excuses? Are we just saying, I'm not going to do it? Are we a friend? Are we a friend to the people we need to be friends for? Are we called? Yeah, we're called. Right? I can tell you we're called. Who chose you? Right? I can tell you. John 15, 14. God spoke to Moses as a friend in the burning bush. And right here in verse 12 of John 15, it says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain. And whatever you ask the father in my name, he shall give you. These things I command that you love one another. That's what God has called us to do. He was our friend. He commanded us to go and do. We're equipped. If they were equipped in the desert to come through with all that, and we're out here, we can do this now. Joshua, Moses always read the rules, did everything, made sure everybody knew what they were supposed to do, right? And then... Joshua did the same thing. He went through the rules and all that. 
And Caleb, I really like Caleb. I'm not sure if we got enough time to go a little bit into Caleb. But Caleb came to Joshua. I'll just round it up this way. Caleb came to Joshua at this time, and he was 85 years old. And I'll show you. I'll run the verse down so we have that. Joshua 14. Let's go. I'd read the whole thing, but he was 40 years old. Let's go. Let's go to uh, number 10. I'll read it from nine. Nine. Ready? Let's go. Joshua 14:9. So this is Caleb right now talking to Joshua saying, hey, man, remember this? I was one of those spies that went out, okay? So and he says, I'll read it from, I'll read it from uh, seven on. I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh, Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. I brought back the word to him that was in my heart. Nevertheless, my brethren who went up Made, my, made the heart of the people melt. But wholly I followed the Lord. That's what Caleb did. I wholly followed the Lord. Verse 9, so Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land your foot has trodden shall be your inheritance and your children's forever, because you have wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, check it out, the Lord has kept me alive. And he said these 45 years Ever since the Lord spoke those words to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness, and now here I am, 85 years old. 85 years old, yet I, as, I am as strong as this day as I was the day that Moses sent me out. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. Now therefore, give me this mountain of the which the Lord spoke in that day, for you heard in that day how the Anakim were there and that the cities were great and fortified. It, may, it might be that the Lord will be with me and I shall be able to drive them out as the Lord said. And Joshua blessed him and said, Phew, bro, go get it. Right? Because by that time, Joshua was like, I'm done. You know, he was on his way. He was 80 something by there. So my charge to you guys, is, Caleb said, I'm going. I'm in it to win it. That's how he was. That's what his, that's what his name meant. Wholly into it. Fully, fully, fully engaged, right? I, was, I didn't know if I should use that, Pastor, but I did want to say that he was, thank you, that that was, that's what we need to do, men. We need to, I wanted to challenge you guys that if you don't have a, if you're a Moses, you got to get a Joshua. If you were a Joshua, Come alongside your Moses. And if you want to be a Caleb, you want to be one of those, those high fire, I know he's around here. I, call, I think Brother Ryan when I think of a Caleb. That brother's always lit up with some kind of fire going on too, right? Or short and quick, I think of Thomas. I know he's out by the barbecue, but that's who I think of anyway. Because <laughs> he's always quick. Yep, we can do that. Let's take that. Let's go and do that. So our challenge as men of a higher standard is if you know a Moses and you know he doesn't have a Joshua, maybe you should check on him and see who, we need, who you need to be following. I don't know who pastor has coming alongside of him. Uh, you know, what, where are we going to go from here? Tony preached a message like this years ago, I remember. He probably remembers it. Pastor Angel, you probably do too. It was like, who's going to take over? Who's going to take over? Okay, we're not 80, but you know. Things happen and, you know, life goes on. You got to have somebody that's going to take your place. We got to start finding those guys. You got, that's you guys. These 40 issues, come on. It's time. It's time to engage. It's time to engage. It's time to engage. Find who you're supposed to be in with and come alongside of them. And if you don't know, check with Pastor Angel. He can tell you where you probably belong. But you probably know already in your hearts where you belong. So that's my challenge to you guys is to, is to be one of those. Find the, find the Moses you need to attach yourself to. Or if you're, a, if you're a Joshua, come alongside that one. If you're Moses, go find a Joshua. Find a Caleb. So I'd say be encouraged with that. 
And that's how you can trust God, by doing that, if you, by having a willing heart. Because all they had back there in the Old Testament was, oh, I'm going to give, I'm going to give, and I'm going to step in, and I'm going to do what God's called me to do. So I thank you men for the, your time. I say sit on that, think about it, ponder it, let God talk to you in your quiet time. I've enjoyed reading the Bible. Now I have more time, Tony. Oh, I'm able to take more time and read, and I can tell you two hours goes by like that, just in a short time, but I can't tell you how much it's jumped off at me. So I'd encourage you to read, read the Bible the whole time if you haven't. I agree. I know I got that from a young brother. That wasn't, you know, that wasn't somebody else saying something. So we all can learn from each other, right? We're here to help each other. Thank you, men. Be blessed. Thank you, Pastor Angel. Pastor Angel. Thank you. Man, that was awesome. He's a teacher. He's not a preacher, you know, he's not a preacher. I learned what a preacher is. You guys know what a preacher is? You guys know what a preacher is? Half teacher, half preacher. He's a teacher, though. That's why you see the notes and where he's going, and he starts taking you there. Boom, 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 boom. He gives you revelation. God had blessed uh, us two weeks ago, me as a, the pastor, and I, we went to Fresno, and a word was given to me. Uh, the revelation would come more and more to me. And uh, for the past year, I've, I've been re reading that. And just as I read, it's just like you say, just coming off. It just, you're like, my God. You know, then when you go to your notes to preach, you're not even looking at your notes anymore because it's in you already. You read it and you studied it and you showed yourself approved unto the Lord. You know, rightly dividing the word of God you know, from spirit to truth, from the spirit to the mind. And revelation comes. And today when he was speaking, I'm like, whew. Revelation was being pronounced to you guys. If you guys just open your hearts, you're going to leave better. I take notes. I'm a note taker. You know, I give my note uh, books to men that are hungry. They'll ask me for them. And I just say, here, study that note uh, book out and go to your Bible and do that. If you take notes, if you're a, no a, no a, a note taker, like Pastor is, I, I buy some of these and just fill them up. Like what you heard today, go home and study it. Read it for yourself. You get your own revelation. Because like he said, in the Old Testament, God would drop into one person, the one he chose. Not in the New Testament. We have a better testament. All of us who receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, he drops in every one of us. And he speaks to every one of us, right? Amen. And it's up to us to obey that word. If you want to get better, not perfect, but you want to get better, you have to apply yourself. It's not just going to happen because you're good looking, you're tall, and things like that. It's not going to happen. It's going to happen when you study the word of God. And it takes time. If you learn how to pray, learn how to pray three three minutes, a minute, before you know it, you're going to be praying for five minutes. Before you know it, you're going to be praying for 15, 30 minutes. Before you know it, you're going to be praying for an hour when you when you separate yourself for the Lord. And when you go to the same thing with studying the word, meditating upon the word, it's going to bless you guys. That was a blessing. Some good revelation. We're going to, we're, uh, we're going to go ahead and receive a, an offering uh, here just because not that we, we need your money. Just the men uh, of a higher standard pays for all the foods and drinks and all that stuff. And we need money just to, for next month, you know. It's not faster or anybody else. We're, when we buy eggs and pastries and all that stuff you're eating, it's all of us putting our, our, our money together and, and giving it unto the Lord, you know. I, when I first started, I used to put uh, IOUs in there. I'm not lying. My first month, I didn't have no money. I was a drug addict, and I was just coming out of my new lifestyle. I was coming into a new lifestyle of Christ, and I was in debt. 
$58,000 of debt when I came to the Lord. And uh, the Lord took 11 years, but he... Uh,